Let's take out our Bibles yeah. and turn to 1 John, a very familiar verse here, 1 John. Chapter 1. Tell them I want to deal with and talk about uh, confession, confessing sins. True and false confessions. When it's a real confession, when it's kind of a hypocritical confession. When God accepts it and when God does not accept it. When God does not accept it. True and false confessions. First John chapter 1. And let's see, we'll begin reading in verse 8. Just a couple verses as we start tonight. There won't be a lot of verses here. First John chapter 1 verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, and the we there means Christians. If we as Christians say that we have no sin, we as Christians, we deceive, oh, me, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So we need to be right about this confession and our sinful nature, Christian, our sinful nature. We still have, but if you're born again, you have that new nature, and that's the nature that should be winning. That's the nature we should be following and obeying, and not the old nature. Oh, okay, verse 9, and here's the main part, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. I believe that means, now I, I don't know if I read this or just thought about it, but it cleanses from all unrighteousness. It means if we deal with the sins we're aware of and the sins that are really being convicted about, we confess those sins, then the other things in our life that God kind of cleanses too, Amen. even if we're not, maybe not aware of them. And that's kind of how I see it, but uh, that's open for discussion a little bit too, I think. But I like at verse 9, though. If we confess our sins, He is faithful. Faith makes you to trust Him every time. Did you ever get tired of confessing your sins? You ever think, Lord, you've heard this before. I've been here before. I've said this before. But God says every time that we confess the sins, every time, He will forgive them. He doesn't get tired of hearing about it. So we confess our sins. It's faithful and he's just. Just means it doesn't go against his justice or his holiness. He's right to do it. He's correct to do it because our sins have been forgiven through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are, it is right for God to do this. He say, well, it's kind of unfair to the Lord. We, we sin and all we do is confess them and he forgives us. Well, let's back up a little. We don't just Confess them. There's more to that word than a lot of people think. Right. That's what I'm going to preach on tonight. Good. Heavenly Father, help me as I preach on this important subject. Lord, it's so misused, misunderstood, and willingly so in so many people's lives. So please help me to preach, to make it clear. And that we'll see, maybe even see ourselves in some of these definitions of the wrong kind of confession. Lord, I pray if we do that, we'll correct those tonight. We'll make things right with you. So we can have your forgiveness and have the joy back as we have the victory back. So help me as I preach tonight, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it. Amen. 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 If we confess our sins, He is faithful. He'll do it every time. And just, it does not go against the holiness of God. Faithful, just to forgive us all these times. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just a couple little verses there, but they say a lot, don't they? Yes. First of all, a thought I have here in the introduction. Number one, it's difficult to tell if people are sincere. It's difficult to tell. Sometimes maybe people will share some things with you or maybe even uh, confess their sins. Now, be careful of doing that. You need to be careful of people there in that area. But it's di difficult to tell if people are sincere. But it's not difficult for the Lord. He knows that people are sincere, not about their confessions. Secondly, confession, and this is one of the reasons it's so important. Confession precedes salvation. Amen. You can't be saved until you there's the right kind of confession of sins, the right kind of 
dealing with our personal sin, the right kind of and wrong kind of attitude towards our sins. So confession precedes salvation. There has to be a confessing of sins in that way. And then also there is hypocritical confession. We know that. Uh, people confess their sins for the wrong reasons. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight a little bit. I've got seven or eight different thoughts here on this. The true and false confessions and the things that, uh, the way people confess their sins that are not, not real good. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. We'll start there. Matthew 23. And verse 23. The first thought here I have about false confession. Confessing lesser sins, but ignoring greater sins. We all have, you know, even as Christians, we still confess our sins. That's what 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 is about. But there's a, a confession where we can confess our lesser sins, but keep and not confess our greater sins. And there are some sins that are, are worse than others. The Bible says that, talking about different degrees. But lesser sins, we can confess smaller things, but the, the things that really are, the, the things that we really love, that, that's greater sins, we, we don't confess that. Now here's an example of Matthew 23, verse 23. And it's talking about the Pharisees here. Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Oh, that's a, a strong word there, hypocrite. In other words, you're claiming to be what you really are not. You're making a show and a pretense of what you really are not. Uh, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters. Weightier things that are more important. There's some things that are more important than other things. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done. Uh, ought ye to have done. And not to leave the other undone. What you're doing is right. You need to tie them those uh, men and anise and come in, like it says there. But the weightier matters, the more important things, are the matters that deal with the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. They're showing a degree of difference here. Now, all sin is sin, but there are some sins worse than others. And there needs to be confession of all our sins, not just the, the lesser sins. And there is a difference there. There's a difference between the lesser sins and the greater sins in our lives. The Pharisees had the problem with the weightier matters. They did the smaller things right, but they did not do the greater things right. Can that happen? Yeah, it can happen. Does it happen even in churches? Yeah, it happens in our churches. Does it happen in even our good, independent, fundamental, premillennial, Bible believing, KJME only, uh, Bible Baptist churches? Yeah. yeah, that can happen there. Does it ever happen in the Bible Baptist Temple, 1565 years ago? Uh, I started rolling a year ago. No, it never happened to you. All right, but what to you? Wait to your men. Some sins are worse than others. We need to confess not only the lesser sins, if we're not doing that, but also those greater sins, the things that we do that we are more at fault with. And it's kind of interesting here in verse 23, the things that bring that are called weightier matters here, notice what they are. The law, judgment, making the right kind of judgment on things, mercy, being merciful to other people, being as merciful as God is. They weren't doing that, were they? And faith, believing the right things. Those are far more important than tithing on those small little uh, herbs like they did there, isn't it? Far more important. But judgment, mercy, faith, and the law, these are more important than other things. And yet in our churches, we can have that problem too. We can have that individually, our problem too. Uh, politicians, they can be against cigarettes, but they're for marijuana. Wow. Yeah. I've never yeah. figured that one out. Right. Marijuana is far worse than cigarettes. That's right. I mean, look at it. Check it out. Research it. And yet cigarettes are on their taboo list, but marijuana, well, maybe because they make a little money on marijuana. In fact, they make a lot of money on marijuana. But they make money on cigarettes, too. Yeah, right. But maybe not as much money as they make on marijuana. I don't know. But, I mean, the, the hypocrisy we see, we see it, it doesn't, it's just not in churches, it's throughout society, isn't it? That's right. Government, politics, everyone. 
There's so much of this problem. Lesser sin, but the greater sin. Hey, I'm going to say this tonight. It's just a few here. And with the virus problem, your people are dying. How many more people are dying because of abortion? Amen. You're right. Yes, sir. What a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What a bunch that's of right. Lesser sins, yeah. Yeah, it's, you're taking it seriously. But what about that? What about alcohol? More people die from alcohol. That's right. right. Why do they True. still not take a cause against alcohol? Amen. Alcohol. Why? Oh, my. Whether it's confessing lesser sins, greater sins. Get an understanding of what I'm saying tonight. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I, I just see it that way. I sure do. So that's one way where it's a hypocritical confession. Confessing, yeah, the lesser sins, but accepting the greater sins, not confessing right. those. Right. Number two, confessing sins in general, but forgetting particular sins. Yes. Lord, bless our missionaries. Okay, yes. that's okay. But get down to, Lord, bless Todd Allen there. They might get his passport. Get specific in our, when we talk about when we pray for things, but get specific in our confessing of sin also. Here, here's a little quote that goes along with this. Where confession is right, it will be specific. Where confession is right, it will be specific. Since we're in Matthew, just turn back to Matthew, well, Matthew 23, we're still in Matthew 23, verse 14 in particular now, so just back up a few verses there. Matthew 23, verse 14. And you got to do some specific things here. Not just generally, we need to confess our sins. No, we need to confess specific sins. Right. Matthew 23, verse 14, still with the Pharisees. All those poor Pharisees. But you know, they deserve it. They deserve every bit of it. Woe unto you, scribes, verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And where have we heard that before? That little phrase. Hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. For a pretense, devour widows' houses. That's a specific thing. That's a specific fault that they have. And the Lord said, and he pointed that out. He got specific here. For make prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. There's a greater judgment coming out of that. But he got specific with the Pharisees. How many times in the Old Testament, too, did the Lord God Almighty get on Israel and told them all their sins, and he got specific exactly what they were doing wrong. He didn't just accuse them in, in general, but he brought up specific sins. This is where you're doing wrong. This is what you're doing wrong. Throughout the Old Testament, time and time and time again, that's what they did. God pointed out specific sins. He never dealt with just generalities until after he got through with the specifics. He got, he made this, and he made that problem, the problem with the girls, and the problem with the marriages, the problem with the different things specifically. And then he says, generally, yeah, you've sinned. But he got into the general only after he dealt with the specific sins. So important. Christian, when you pray, name that sin. Love something. Which program or something? Name that sin. Uh, <laughs> See, Sunday nights better come out Sunday nights. It's a little more relaxed here, isn't it? <clears throat> Name that sin. Be specific. <clears throat> if, I'm sure you've done that before. You've named this. Is it doesn't make you feel uneasy or embarrassed. Oh, Lord. And you name the sin in your confession. It's embarrassing. But embarrassment is a humbling thing, too, isn't it? It's good to humble ourselves. So confessing sins in general doesn't really do the job because it seems like you're trying to hide from those particular sins that you should be confessing. Boy, oh, that's convicting tonight. Pray specifically. But remember the good news. If we confess our sins, what? God will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pray specifically about those things. Number three, another type of hypocritical confession is Confessing sins under pressure when you're forced to. When you're forced to. This is similar to another one I'm going to bring up here about confessing our sins when we're confronted with them. So let's turn to Joshua chapter 7. Some of you are starting to 
think about what, what is this in Joshua 7? Some of you probably already arrived at the right answer. Ch Joshua chapter 7, we'll begin reading in verse 13 here. About confessing your sins only when the pressure, pressure is put upon you. Only when you're forced to, when there's no way out, there's no excuses, no justifications you can come up with anymore, and you just realize you've been caught. You've been caught. And there's no excuses anymore. You have to confess it because everybody knows it's true. If you try to deny it, everybody knows you're a liar. I mean, it's so obvious that you're, you've done wrong. It's so obvious of your about your sin, what, what you've done, that you just have to admit it because you got caught. When you're forced to. Joshua chapter number 7 and verse 13. See the story of uh, Achan here. The sin's already taken place. Achan's already taken of the forbidden things. And then verse 13, the Lord speaks here. And he says, Up, oh, sanctify the people. Sanctify, set them apart. For something needs to be done. Sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of the O Israel. Something's wrong. Something needs to be dealt with. And he calls it a curse. That's a pretty strong word, isn't it? There is an accursed thing in the midst of the O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies. Here's why how and why we are defeated as Christians. Because there's something we need to deal with and we're not. And it shows because we do not stand before our enemies. We do not have the victory in our Christian walk. Because there's something there, and we know it's there, and we're hiding it. We think we're hiding it from God, but He knows it's there. You've got to deal with it. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies. Now that in itself ought to scare you. Because we have enemies. I don't want them to have the victory over me. I want to have the victory over them. I want to have the victory over my enemy, sin, self, and Satan. I want to have the victory over those things. And it says here, if you allow these things, there's some cursed thing there, there's something you're not dealing with in your life. Thou canst not stand before your enemies. You're gonna have you're not gonna have victory anymore. Until you until, until. I like the word until it means it can't be changed. It can't be better. You can't have a victory. Until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. It shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh away shall come according to the families. Then we go down to verse number 16. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah. And he took the family of the Zarites. And he brought the family of the Zarites man by man. And then narrowing it down. You ever been there? Where you know you're the one they're trying to find or something. Uh, people are being eliminated and it's getting closer and closer and closer to you. It's an exciting place to be. Scary place to be. So Zara, man by man, and Zabdi was taken and brought his household man by man. Uh, and Achan, here finally. And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of uh, Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto him, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. So in other words, do this before the Lord God Almighty. This is important. The witness here is God himself. God himself is the witness here. To make the Lord of Israel and make confession, there's our word confession, unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Yeah. Verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed I have sinned. Well, yeah. Everybody knows he was the one. Everybody knows now he's the one. They went through the whole list. They went through all these people. They went down to Achan. And Achan, everybody knew was guilty. And he admits his guilt. You see a little hypocrisy here. You think, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, where, because he's just being forced to it, he can't, he has no justification, he has no way to excuse it, uh, he knows he's on the spot, he knows he's guilty of it all, and so what else can he say? What else can he say? But yeah, I'm guilty. And he can answer Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. By the way, I think this is a little insight, a little example, that's a better word, example, 
of the great white throne judgment someday when all the lost people will stand before the Lord one by one. None of them will have an excuse. None of them will have a, an opportunity to make things right. Too late. Too late. Make things right now. And thus and thus have I done, when I saw among the spores a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold and 50 shekels of weight. Then I coveted them. Well, that's good. He coveted them. Yeah, he did. He wanted them badly. Coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. See, every sin can be brought out. Every sin can be brought out eventually. Why not bring it out yourself now personally and pray about it, pray to the Lord about it? They're hidden the earth in the midst of my tent and silver under So Joshua sent messengers and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Achan, you're guilty. Verse 24. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, uh, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The sin affects other people too. The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones and, then, and burned them, them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of the place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. People say, well, God doesn't do that. Today is the New Testament, the age of grace. Yes, it is. But there's coming a time when the age of grace and His mercy is over, too. Right. Yeah. And then there will be only judgment. Mm -hmm. Only judgment. Like I said in the great white throne judgment there. Take care of matters now. Take care of matters. Don't wait. When, you, when you're finally found out, it's too late then. When you're finally found out, it's too late then. Don't put it off. Pray about it. I, you know one of the things I like about confessing my sins to the Lord? You know nothing about it. It's just between me and the Lord. Right. And He keeps the secrets. He keeps things private. He keeps my sins confidential. Praise the Lord for that. Now, I'm not saying I'm a serial killer, but I'm not a perfect... Let's change the subject. Let, let's change it to you. You're not in your God. What do I say Confess to me for the Lord. He keeps it private, confidential, and He forgives you. Yeah. And then after that, He blesses you. That's right. That's right. He blesses you after that too. Yeah. Get the blessing. Meet the conditions. Confess those sins so God can bless you. God, God can bless you in, without any limits. Without any limits. Yeah. Well, do that. Confess your sins. Don't wait until you're under pressure until you're found out. It's too late then. It's too late then. All right, here's another false confession. Confessing sins without any intention of forsaking them. Uh, yeah. Or you tell me what reference I'm going to go to now. Proverbs. Proverbs, okay. Chapter 28. Proverbs 28, verse number 13. Wow, you're reading my mind tonight. Proverbs 28, verse number 13. What are we talking about now? Confessing sins without any intention to forsake them. Now again, I bring this up often because I want people to understand this too. We're not talking sinless perfection, but we're talking desire to be right in God's sight. We're talking about a situation in a, person, a Christian's personal life where he knows he needs to deal with something and he does deal with it. And he wants to quit every single time we confess our sins. We should have the attitude, I don't want to do this ever again. When we confess our sins, it has to have that attitude. I want to forsake them. I don't ever want to do this sin again. Lord, forgive me. I, I, and then what happens when you sin again? Now, I'm not saying you ought to or you have to, but I'm saying it does happen, though, doesn't it? Let's be honest tonight. It does happen. Yeah. It's the same sense, too. If you start to...
get cold away from the Lord, you'll go back to the same sins that you did before you got saved. It's not going to be a different sin or a different kind of sin. You're going to go back to the same old ways, the same old sin you did before you got saved. That'll be your direction, at least your direction. But you need to forsake it. And every time you confess your sin, you need to have the attitude, Lord, I don't ever want to do this again. Oh, Lord, please give me the victory. Uh, I confess my sin. You name that sin. You're specific about it. And you say, I don't ever want to do this again. And God will forgive you. But you have to have that attitude, too. Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 13. Let's read it. <laughs> he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them. See? That's part of confession. The desire, you don't want to do this anymore. Forsaketh them shall have mercy. You know, in the, the Catholic Church, they, they have last rites. When somebody's ready to die, they go, when the priest goes there, and they do their whatever it is they do over the person. Because they're trying to get rid of the sins up to that point. And then up to that point, then they're forgiven. That's so different from the way the Bible talks about confession of sins, doesn't it? Yes. Talk about confession of sins, not just to cover them, you got to get rid of them so they're not, they won't trouble you later, you're, you're still not accountable. But you confess your sins with the attitude, you don't want to do this anymore. You want to quit this sin. You want to just stop doing this sin. Not just be forgiven, you want to stop doing this sin too. And change things around there. Now, will you do that sin later on again? Maybe. In some ways we do. But then we need to confess it. But a confession without a desire to forsake it is not a confession accepted by God. Amen. Mm. A confession without a desire to forsake it. Again, are we talking sinless perfection? No. Are we saying you never will do that again? I'm not even saying that. But I am saying a true biblical confession must include that desire of forsaking that sin. That, that sin bothers you. You don't want to do it. You want to stop. May that be, be your last time ever that you got on your knees and you called out to God to forgive you for that sin. May that be the last time you ever do that sin. But it does happen. But you know something, over time, there becomes, there becomes a weakening of that sin. There becomes a stronger stand against that sin. You do get stronger, and sometimes it happens where that is the last time you have to confess that sin. The last time. But you have to have that attitude for biblical confession of sins. You have to have the attitude, you want to forsake that sin too. You want to stop that sin. You want to quit that sin. And you want to make that the last time you ever have to confess that sin. Whether it happens or not, that's a desire, though. That's good. When we confess our sins. All right, what's another kind of uh, hypocritical confession of sins? Well, when we confess our sins because we want to be relieved from the consequences mm -hmm. of the sin. There's a fear of punishment. You know, when we confess our sins, it should not be because we don't want the consequences of sin in our life. We know there's consequences. And they're bad consequences, not good consequences. In fact, a lot of people wish they could find a way where they could sin with no consequences. They try to find a way where they can do what's wrong, and they know what's wrong, they know what's sin. And then those consequences attach to that sin, but they're trying to finagle away. They're trying to find some way where they can still sin, but somehow not have the consequences, the bad consequences, attached to their sin. Right. Sinning without consequences does not happen. Like we need to get our head out of the clouds. That, maybe that's a very blunt way to say it, but get your head out of the clouds. All sin has consequences, and you cannot sin without those consequences. Uh, be sure about that then. Be sure. What's that verse? Okay, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, be sure your sin will be sure your sin will find you out. That's Numbers chapter 32. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. There it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. All sin has consequences. Don't confess your sin just because you want don't want those consequences. Right, right. Don't confess your sin just because you want your life to be easier. Uh, don't confess your sin just because you want your life to be more comfortable. 
Don't confess your sin just because you don't want those consequences of sin attached to your sin. And you don't have to suffer and go through that bad experience. Confess your sin because God doesn't like it and God's against it. And you're going against God Almighty. That's why we need to confess our sins. Because we're going against God's word and God's command that we should love. Amen. We should love. Amen. Should be because our sins are against God. Right. Amen. That's why we need to confess our sins. Not just because if we confess our sins, then God will get rid of the consequences or held there. No, it's more than that. It's much deeper than that. Confess your sins because they are uh, disobedience and rebellion against an almighty, holy, loving God. Amen. Confess your sins for those reasons. But a lot of people, if they can only figure a way to keep doing their sins but not have the bad part attached to it. Confessing sins, different types of hypocritical. One last thought tonight yet. Confessing sins but still loving them. You know the Bible talks about that as being a double-minded man. I think that's one application of it. There's many other applications. I believe that is one of them. A double-minded man. He wants heaven, but he wants the world too. He wants Jesus Christ. But he wants his sin too. And I'll tell you, they connive and they try to figure, how can I do this? How can I have salvation but not, re not have to repent of my sin too? Well, the Bible doesn't give that option, do they? Does it? No, the Bible doesn't give that option. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He wants heaven, but he wants the world too. It doesn't work that way. Confessing sins but still loving them. You confess the sin, but secretly inside of you, and we still have the old nature, but inside of you, there's that desire, and I'd still like to do that. One, one old time preacher, he was a character. He says, that if, when I get to heaven, if I find out that all these preachers are telling me that smoking cigars is bad, if I find out it's not bad, I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to talk to them about that. Because he likes smoking his cigars, I guess. I thought, well, that's a pretty pitiful example of <laughs> smoking cigars. But that's one thing he brought up in a humorous way to illustrate things. Yeah. See, we need to turn from things. Confessing sin, but still, still loving them. All right, what are some true and false confessions? What are some hypocritical confessions? Confessing lesser sins, but not greater sins. Confessing sins in general, but not specific or particular sins. Confessing sins under pressure when you're forced to. Confessing sins under any, uh, without intention to forsake them. That needs to be part of our confession. That shows a sincere heart that we want to stop and want to quit those things. Confessing sins until you're confronted with them. Again, the example of Aiken. Confessing sins only to be relieved of the consequences. Is this bad consequence attached to that? Confessing sins of the heart. I'm sorry, yes, sins in the heart. God is supposed to the heart and confessing sins, but still loving them, loving them in the heart. Now, what's the last thought I want to bring up here? When we confess our sins, has God accepted our confession? Has God accepted it, our confession? All these things, hypocritical confessions. But what understand and realize, friends, too, that when you do things right, God accepts it. And the blessings that are attached to that. The negative things, if they're not, the blessings, the blessings, if there are. Do things right. Confess that sin before the Lord in the right way, the right way. Don't let there be any hypocrisy attached to it. If we confess our sins, it opens up, for those who are not saved, it opens up salvation. And if they are saved, it opens up a, a right relationship with the Lord. Amen. A close, close walk with Him. What's more blessed than that? A close walk with our Lord. Heavenly Father, as we think about these things, the hypocrisy that can be found in people's confessions, the confession of their sins. Lord, I pray we're not guilty of that. But Lord, I'm sure we are at different times. Forgive us for that too. We pray for that. We need to have that idea and thought of forsaking our sins too, not just confessing them to cover them, but forsaking them too.
Lord, search our hearts. Give us what we need tonight. Work at people's hearts. Lord, you know our needs better than we know ourselves. So we pray as we have this time of invitation and this time of prayer that you'll use this time to work in people's lives. May this be a very special time of our service tonight, too. In Jesus' name, now I pray and ask it. Amen.